All right, good morning. I'm very happy you're here because, you know, it's Tuesday, it's cold, uh, it's the end of medium. You can tell I have medium voice, you know, this happens when you speak all the time and do other things, which I won't mention here. But thanks very much for coming by. Um, so uh, let's start at top. This is my first time I'm using the iPad to present. Uh, because when I, I do a lot of presentations speaking about the future of media, and one thing I don't like is that you always have to follow the order of the slides, right? uh, which is kind of annoying for me and annoying for the audience because it's like being a robot eventually. You just click and go on, right? So now I don't really have an order. I'm going to skip around. So if you have a question, you can ask me right away. Uh, if you have input, I should leave something out, talk more about something else. You can also ask me. Uh, but I will actually start at the top here. Um, just put this cable down here. Okay, so um, briefly what I do, many of you may say, what in the world is a futurist? Um, I don't know that word even exists in French. I, I suppose in some way it does. But uh, I'm a futurist. I wrote a book called The Future of Music in 2005. And very sadly, people are still buying this book because you know, it's an old book and it's still true. Um, basically, what I do is I look at trends and developments about five years in the, into the future. And I help companies to make up new business models. I also work with people, government, organizations. OK, this has nothing to do with, for, with predictions or knowing something that you don't know. It's just we spend all of our time being a little bit early. Okay? Uh, I used to be in the startup business starting companies, and I was always 10 years early, which is not so good when you start a company. Uh, but as an advisor, it's a good thing. And there's an interesting saying. You know, the guy who started IBM, um, Thomas Watson, and now the Watson machine named after him, he said, I think there's a world market for five computers. Uh, that's what he said in 1943. So one thing that's really important is to get ready for the future is to have what I call foresights, OK? In other words, if you're sitting here today, you're thinking about how you're going to sell or, or offer music tomorrow, but it does, it's not very helpful to think of iTunes, right? Because iTunes is here now. Right? What is coming after iTunes? What is coming after Spotify? Uh, there's a saying about uh, if he had had us and Henry Ford, what he, uh, if people had asked him, no, other way around. If Henry Ford had asked people what they wanted, they would have said they want faster horses, right? because they only knew horses. But he built a car. So our job, because things are moving really fast, is to pay attention to the next thing. And, and in a way, you could say that this is really my job. Uh, I'm listening to stuff that goes on. And then I try to help companies. I advise over 100 companies worldwide, from, from Sony to uh, uh, Google, YouTube, many others, uh, but mostly in the content sectors. All of my books and publications are free except for my first book, which is published uh, through Berkeley, The Future of Music. So if you just go, go to Google and put my name, Gert, and free PDFs, you find everything. Okay? I have five books available, more or less for free. You can also buy them at Amazon if you, if you want the debt tree version. I have a Kindle app and an iPhone app and so on. So We'll go into that later. Anyway, uh, this is sort of an overview of my books. My latest book is called The Future of Content, which is uh, $3 on, the, on, the, on Amazon Kindle. And saving trees, there's no PDFs, uh, no printing available. And my iPhone app, just look for Futurist. Uh, you'll be able to watch all my stuff from there. So uh, I want to start here. This is an important topic, right? There's Julian from WikiLeaks, and Julian says, I give private information on corporations to you for free, and I'm the villain, you know, the bad guy. And Mark from Facebook says, I give your private information to corporations for money. I'm man of the year. So this is a good sign that we live in very confusing times. Okay? Sometimes we don't know what's what. In America, a couple of weeks ago, we were discussing a law that would make it illegal for companies if they had any possible infringement, even JPEGs, PDFs, whatever, it would have been possible to shut down the websites 
on a day's notice without a trial. Right? We, we have a lot of confusion about what's what, right? who should get paid for what and who should pay and so on. These are confusing times primarily because uh, we're now getting connected on a global level. Um, and Steve Jobs, uh, rest in peace, you know, he said a lot of really smart things. I mean, he was a very special character, so it's impossible to emulate Steve Jobs. Don't try. But uh, one thing he said about his life says he wants to put a ding in the universe. Okay. Now, I was looking at the title of this presentation saying, like, really, if you're thinking about how you can make a living with music in a digital world, right, well, you have to start by making a ding, you know, by creating something that's just you. Right? In other words, just because we have the internet doesn't mean you're going to automatically make more money if people can download your stuff or find you, right? You have to be special. I mean, look at what's really successful today. It's all stuff that's highly special, that's niches, that people are excited about. Look at the successful brands that we have today, right? It, they all make an a ding into the universe, as Steve has said. So I think this is a very important uh, paradigm to consider. Now, uh, in this society, what I call the network society, most of you are young enough to know what this means. Right? Uh, I'm 50, so I, I, I grew up, when I was a musician and producer a long time ago, I went to Berkeley College and I had a career as a musician. There was no internet. We would have to send out a CD to get a gig. We have to make a phone call to call people up. There was no way to reach out to people. There was no way to be found except for in the mail or in Billboard magazine, you know, which already existed back then. Today, in the network society, we're living in a whole different world. Okay? This head sort of explains what that world is. You know, it's essentially a connection of wheels. Everything is interconnected. Okay? This also means that we don't exist by ourselves. Right? Walt Disney, Universal Music, to start companies like that today would be impossible, right? because they're one big wheel. They're not like this. Right? I mean, there are independent companies who control production, distribution, marketing, all of these things is part of what they do. Right? Microsoft is a, is a company that is more like this now, but started as a company that's one big wheel. So now we're living in a society that's completely interconnected. So I can guarantee you will not make money with music in the future if we don't work out a deal with Google or with the telecom companies or the advertisers, the device makers. It won't work. Okay. This is a moving part. It's an ecosystem. Okay. So one of the things that we need to work on is to get off this idea of saying that you know, we won't talk to you, we won't allow you to use the music, and therefore we make more money. This is a complete illusion. I mean, music industry is now basically one of those wheels, and it's a very small wheel, right? To be exact, uh, $15.7 billion. You know how big the telecom economy is? Anybody have any idea? Mobile phones, operators, right? 3.7 trillion a year. So that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.5% of what they do. Right? $350 million a day spent on SMS. So the music industry is now part of a much larger story, but a very important story with music, right? Because creativity is emotion is what drives a lot of things, and music is all about that. So in a networked society, we can't say, you know what, uh, if we don't like this, we don't play. Right? If this wheel here does not correspond with the other wheels, you know, what happens if, of course, the other wheels disconnect and continue? And that's what we see now. We have to connect with the other wheels, we cannot afford to say, well, we don't play ball because we don't make enough money from you guys yet. I mean, the idea of saying that you will not license Spotify because you're not enough, making enough money yet is suicide, right? I mean, think about the logic. If you had said 70 or 80 years ago or 100 years ago that you would not license radio because it's A, it's free, that's bad, and B, it's not paying enough, then you would have killed the very mechanism that made music the biggest phenomenon in the 60s and 70s, which was radio. Right? We need to give permission to try stuff. Otherwise, we're always going to stop what can innovate us. So this is a very, very big problem in the music business, is that we ask too early for too much, and we kill innovation. I checked the other day, there are 778 companies 
who tried to innovate in music, they're dead. Right? Two of them were mine, by the way. But just a couple of days ago, Beyond Oblivion, a New York-based company, filed for bankruptcy, right? the latest in the attempt to innovate the music business, right? Because we're not giving enough permission. We're not giving enough way to actually build this, right? Now artists are saying, well, Spotify, you know, I get whatever, you know, a billion plays, I only get $100. Well, that's not good, clearly. But Spotify has three million users. I'm paying users, right? Let's have Spotify have a billion users, right? How much money are you going to make for this? Let's get YouTube to have two billion active users, right? Share the advertising money with you. YouTube can make several billion a month in advertising. Then we see real money. Right? So let's not be too quick with, with saying that you know, we, we don't allow things to nurture. It's like saying your baby grows up being a PhD. You know? No, it's a baby first. You have to grow it. Right? You have to actually allow it to move. So in this world now, the digital world, we're soon going to add the other three billion, the Brazilians, the Indonesians, the Chinese, and they're moving much, much quicker with everything that we've ever seen. In India, you have people connecting to the internet now that never had radio or television. And now they're watching YouTube on their mobile phones. I mean, what better opportunity could we have as artists to reach those people, to sell them our commercials, to make music for them, right, to distribute to them, to do tours there, and vice versa. They here, right? both directions. So there, you know, the rules of the game are completely different. Right? The rules of the game of how you pay for music are not going to work there. And this has nothing to do with copyright. This is just reality. Right? So we take the word copyright. We'll talk about that later. I think we need to remove the first part, which is the copy. Uh, everything that we do on the internet makes a copy. Right? You play a song on YouTube, you are, in fact, making a copy on the cache of your computer. In fact, if you use a download helper extension on Firefox, you can keep that copy. That's what kids do now to get music. Right? It's simple. Every stream, every click, every copy, every forward, every email creates copy of music. And most of that is not legal in parentheses, right? but it happens anyway. So we have hundreds of companies who have used this idea of saying, well, you know, basically, it's the same. Streaming and copying is the same thing. We don't live in a copy economy. So if you're a lawyer, you're in deep trouble, right? Because the entire setup depends on saying that you have copies, you have radio, which is free. You've got this whole system, right? But the internet blows away this idea of saying you know, what we think is actually happening. The most popular way of sharing music today on the internet is not file sharing. right? Is not those programs like LimeWire and what have you. Right? It's basically people sending stuff back and forth on YouTube and ripping what's on YouTube, right? just uh, recording it, so to speak, which is not per se illegal. In some countries, it could be. But anyway, we have 3 billion people connecting, and they will call the shots. Right? They will tell us how much they're willing to pay. And I have to tell you, if, if I find another person who's going to tell me that people aren't willing to pay for content, I think I'll throw up. Right? I mean, if you look at the global trends, people are paying everywhere for content. Right? They're paying for dating, which is content, right? That's database. They're paying for LinkedIn. You guys on LinkedIn? $550 million. We are the content of LinkedIn, right? They're paying for Netflix, 24 million subscribers, paying 10 bucks. And they're paying for Farmville, 450 million last year. They're paying $6.8 billion for virtual products, flowers. They're paying for iPhone apps. Right? So don't tell me they're not paying for content. Right? This is just not true. But we're asking them to pay in a way that's a punishment. Right? We have to get engaged with what people actually want to do. And this is what's going to happen in the, in the very near future. You guys are lucky that you're actually at the end of this period uh, in terms of how this all is coming together. OK, the digital natives. This is a baby. Are you going to play or what? Start playing. It's not playing. Sorry. I gave away the whole point of my video. Anyway, uh, here's a baby. OK, uh, you can check it out on YouTube yourself. But 
iPads are very popular with kids, small kids, right? Because you can touch them and do stuff. They learn in a very short time that you can paint, you can create things, and you can make a photo, or you can use photo booth. They learn all these things, right? And then you have uh, this, this shot here over on, on the uh, other side basically showed a, a baby saying, OK, uh, I'm going to use a real magazine, as you can see here. And she's trying to zoom the page of the real magazine, right? And these are digital natives. They're completely different assumption of what happens here, right? I mean, of course, not, she's just a baby. But you know, when you're 10 years old with this sort of mindset, if you can't interact and you can't just make it work, you're not interested. You don't exist. Right? In other words, if we make these people in the future stick to the old rules from 20 years ago, we're, we're toast, right? We're not going to even be considered. So we have to think about digital natives, what people do on the internet uh, in the future going forward. And one of those important things that you should get used to is cloud computing. And not in the Apple way, but in the general way. Right? What's happening is that all content is moving into the cloud. And we discussed this in 1999 with mp3.com and Napster. Right? It was the same idea. Right? But now all content is moving into the cloud. That means music, television, films, education, berkeleymusic.com, right? the biggest online music school in the world, is online. Right? Health records, banking, money. Scary thought, of course. If it all moves in the cloud, we can be, in theory, we, we, we can be tracked, right? Which is a scary thought, right? But it will happen anyway. We won't be using credit cards in 10 to 15 years, depending on the country, even earlier. We won't be uh, buying textbooks for universities. We'll have a device that has all the textbooks coming through the cloud. Right? And this is, in the music business, this is our chance to get to those people on the other end of the cloud. Right? Because guess what? If we do this, our costs are next to zero. The only cost we have here is an intention cost. Right? We have to actually make sure that they come to us. Right? That is the real cost. So it's been said many times before, also the speech before here, that attention is the currency. If in this cloud I have 68 million songs, right, how in the world is anybody going to pay attention to you? Of course, you have to be in the cloud. Nothing you can do about it not to be in the cloud. But you have to find a way to actually get to people uh, and to connect with them to see what they want to do. Right? And they will do it on mobile devices, right? primarily on mobile devices. If you have a question, just please fire away, OK? So the future of music is the cloud and the crowd. The only two things that matter was said already 50 times this week in the conferences. right? Remember this, there's only two things that matter, OK? One is the creator, and the other one is the so-called consumer, the user. Okay? We're up for debate in between. Sorry to tell you, but in a digital economy, it's the creator that matters because only they can create, and it's not going to be any better because they have software, right? It's still going to be a process of human creation. And the consumer. And if you're looking at some of these services, you guys know Flipboard, right? A really amazing way to read news, Spotify, Simfy, Instapaper, BBC iPlayer, right? What does this tell you? The content moves to the cloud. We use software to access it. And the connection of the cloud and the crowd is the money. And this is why the new players in the music business will not be the labels or the societies, because there are middlemen. right? They will be people who make that connection between the cloud and the crowd. Right? The search engines, the social networks. Right? Facebook goes publi public sometime this week. Right? They will have a $100 billion war chest to do this. $100 billion. You know how much Vodafone has for innovation? Right? The entire budget for innovation, I think, is something like $16 billion, right? And Facebook has $100 billion. Right? And no costs. Right? They don't have a network. They just make software. So when you think about this, right, basically, we need to figure out how we can get in this process of the cloud and the crowd. And the important part here is, of course, filtering. I mean, I'm not interested in all of the music from Indonesia. I just want the particular music I'm interested in or that's recommended by my friends. right? Because in, in when you buy stuff, 
96% of people buy through social recommendation. And that's on the internet even more pronounced. Right? We buy what somebody else has said that they also bought. Right? That is the process of how we do stuff. Right? This is why when I'm on Facebook and I play Spotify track and it shows up on Facebook, I get like emails, people saying, oh, I really like the song that you published through Spotify on Facebook and I bought it or I bought the concert ticket or right? this is social commerce. So the thing is, if we don't allow to be in the cloud, right, or if we make it too difficult, or if we put all these rules, for example, as, as iTunes does, you know, that you, you start watching and 24 hours later you, your movie is gone, right? We're pissing off the people who are giving us the money. Right? I mean, how, this is like going in an airplane and when you come in they would say, you know what, you can only stand. Because, you know, we, we figured that you, you're healthy. Right? It makes no sense whatsoever. So there, you know, when five billion people are connected to the global network, right? I mean, right now we have about two billion. In reality, it's really only one billion who have high-speed internet access, even less who are actually active. Right? So in five years, we have five billion people. Right now, the world is about seven billion. Okay? So think about the huge opportunity for us to reach those people, but also to create business that doesn't cost anything to facilitate, except for attention. When I got started on LinkedIn, you guys are on LinkedIn, right? We can connect. I'm G. Leonhardt there. Um, when I started on LinkedIn, my, my buddy Ray Hoffman in those days started it. I was number 8,000. Okay, today is 178 million on LinkedIn. I sent emails to my friends, mostly in the music business, saying we should connect so we can talk about important stuff and also develop business, right? You know what the answer was? I said, why in the world should I connect with strangers? to talk about stuff. If you're not already with me, I don't want to do business with you. Right? I, I want to keep behind a wall. And what we do is a club, right? You're not in the club, you're out of the club. Right? It's, it's that simple, right? Well, guess what today? We're all in the same boat, right? The same CEOs who wouldn't take my LinkedIn request, they're asking me for recommendation today on LinkedIn. Right? They're coming to the same point where we're saying, if you're not connected, you're dead. Right? So the first step you should do today is to network with everybody in the room to help each other how to figure out how to solve these problems. Right? Because these are collective problems, they're not singular problems. Right? So whether you're a writer or a musician or a label or, or a publisher, we all have the same problem, which is how to get attention. Right? That is our basic problem. Right? And because when we have attention, we can monetize. OK, um, very important point, right? You've seen the Maslow need hierarchy. <clears throat> Maslow is a a sociologist uh, who said basically we have uh, the human needs are uh, physiological safety, belonging, esteem, self-actualization, and, and sex is somewhere in there, in there as well. It's a very simple pyramid. You know, you go up the pyramid until you have more room, then you say, well, now I want self-realization, right? But today, in a digital economy, it's, it's also changed in that we have food, shelter, and the top of the pyramid is the mobile phone. I mean, it's amazing how you can see in Brazil or in Africa, when people have five more dollars, you know what they're going to do? They're going to buy a mobile phone. Right? They're going to top up the phone to make calls. Right? This is the digital economy. Right? This is the same people that we're going to sell to. Because when they have a mobile phone, we can reach them. So another thing you should do tomorrow when you come to the office, everything you do needs to be available for mobile formats. And I'm not talking about apps for downloading. Right? Mobile versions of your website. It will take you a day to do this. Google has free tools for this, to turn your site into a mobile site. There's an Israeli company called Conduit Mobile. They've just launched here at Medium. They do a really great web app for free. And there's many more, like MoFuse and many others, right? So if your website isn't mobile, you're making a big mistake, because most of the people in the future will be using mobile devices to look at your stuff. They will not be using computers, right? The CEO of Google, the former CEO now, Eric Schmidt, uh, three years ago, he said that, that basically everything, the first step, is mobile. Okay, think about the beauty of this. You know, if you go to my website about my uh, Music 2.0 book called Future of, uh, no, it's called um, musicfutures.com. I keep forgetting my own URLs, I have too many. Musicfutures.com, okay? This is a place I put up where you can go with any mobile phone. And it cost me like $5 to do this. 
And you can read my whole book on the mobile phone. Okay. Last year, most of my traffic uh, in regards to all these things came from the mobile sites and from this site, people reading a very simple $5 site saying they can read it on the BlackBerry, they can read it worldwide, they can download the PDF, they can do all these things there. Right? So if you have a label or an artist or a publisher, if you're a composer, you have to have a mobile site. Because that's, that's where all the action is going to be. Clearly, uh, the future is mobile. And uh, you know, think of your world like this, mobile first. Okay. Don't forget, in America, for example, we're, we're stuck with the computer because we have the money to buy one and it's a safe place to put one. Right? That's not the case in India or Brazil. Right? There's often no power. There's not a safe place to put them. And then there's, uh, there's water problems and what have you. Right? It's all mobile devices. It's all mobile internet devices. So if you want to reach the other three billion, as we call them, you got to switch to the mobile. Um, if you don't know what this is, who knows what this is? Ah, great improvement. Uh, it's a QR code. In fact, you can zap it right now if you want. But this is a shortcut. This is a shortcut to one of my ideas of paying with attention. Actually, if you click on this, it takes you to payingwithattention.com, which is a bunch of stuff about how that works. Okay. It's a shortcut. This is widely used in Asia, for example. Now, now we have uh, people with radio frequency ID chips and with near field communications where you have shortcuts to assets. Right? For example, for bands, this is the most direct way when you play a gig, you put up a poster with the code. People can take the mobile, they make a photo, the photo connects to the website, boom, you're there. Right? Don't have to remember anything, just make a photo. In fact, now there's bands playing with the QR code as a t-shirt for that reason. So, I mean, clearly that is a, a, a sort of a shortcut in a simple way. We have to keep in mind that uh, basically what we have today, I mean, if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? Consumers are leaping. Right? Consumers are doing stuff that we never heard of because we're busy writing music or doing whatever, right? I mean, what's happening on Facebook is absolutely astounding, right? Last year, there were 56 laws overturned by Facebook action or never launched. Right? 270 companies last year were threatened with Facebook action and had to change what they do because these people made so much noise right, that they couldn't continue the practice. Banks, insurance companies, oil companies, Greenpeace went on Facebook against Volkswagen, right, against their practice of what they're buying, what they sell. Right? I mean, consumers are leaping. And this is happening in music. The consumers are saying, you know what, this is all nice and find your ideas about how to do this, but we want to do something else. Going back to one of my favorite topics, Spotify, uh, right, consumers are saying, clearly, we love this idea, but we're not ready to pay $10. And the reason being is, it's YouTube. Right? It's everywhere else, we get the same thing, it's just a little bit more difficult, but OK. Consumers are saying, you know, we want another offer, and then we're willing to pay. And then we're willing to upsell, which is the very idea of what I call talk about later, which is freemium, right? Starting with free and then making it premium. Think about this logic for a second, okay? If services like Spotify got one dollar a month from people, one dollar, like one lousy dollar, not from people, but also from advertising that they would cost, right? So it doesn't have to be the people themselves. One dollar, right? A billion users at one dollar, it's a billion dollars a month, it's 12 billion dollars a year, right? And there's a lot more than one billion people. It will be the entire music industry in one swoop. Of course, then you can say, well, it doesn't work, it commoditizes music and so on and so on, right? Not true. Right? Look at radio, look at cable TV, look at the copy machine. Did the copy machine devalue books? Well, the answer is clearly not. You can copy as much as you want. It's not very convenient to copy an 800-page book right, and carry it around and you, know, you, you pay for the package. So consumers are leaping. We have to get along with this. And this is what they're doing. This is a video of a Twitter feed when the Egyptian uh, ruler, Mubarak, had to leave. There was a, a, a certain time of the day or the evening where he was supposed to come and speak. And he wasn't showing up. Right? On Twitter, this motif developed that said, reasons Mubarak is late, was the hashtag you know, on Twitter. 
and there were people tweeting like this. There were over 100,000, I mean, going like this, right, with jokes about why Mubarak was late. Right? Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that people are doing now. They're taking action, right? They're doing stuff like this. And this works both directions, right? If people have a problem, then uh, Kenneth Cole, you may know the uh, clothing company, right? He tweeted, the reason that there's so much trouble in Egypt is because our new collection is going into the stores today. Right? He made a joke about that, right? And within a day, everybody was boycotting Kenneth Cole and stopped buying stuff, and he had to go and, and excuse himself, and he, you know, it was a big thing. So if we're in the music business, we have to fish where the fish are, which means we have to go where they are doing these things. And where are they these days? I mean, in China, they're on QQ, and, and here they're on Twitter, and in Weibo in China, and so on and so on. We have to go and fish where the fish are. And ask yourself, you know, wherever you're from, where are your fish? That is the key question. You have to find out that question before you can think about marketing, right? It's also a question of who you are. For example, if you are a writer, and you have to find a niche where you can be so strong in that niche that everybody comes to you automatically. Right? Where you can find an exact location of what you think you can do best. And then basically find out how that works. I mean, Twitter obviously is a very good example in general how this works. OK, we're living in this world now, right? This is the world of liquidity. It's fluid. We hate anything that slows us down or that makes it hurt. Right? This is why we hate the Wi-Fi here. Right? No, just kidding. Yeah. It's not liquid. Right? It's not good enough. Right? We go to EasyJet or Ryanair or any of those places. You know, the booking process is great. The boarding process is terrible. Right? But buying and booking and changing is like this. is completely liquid. So that's what we love about services that are completely liquid, like cable TV. You know, it's just, you just do whatever you want. It's liquid. Right? So now, uh, because the consumer has all the power, we're now looking to create only systems that are liquid. If your system isn't liquid, don't bother. Right? I mean, you have to take away the hurdles. In the music industry, we've had dozens of hurdles. You know, rights problems, territorial problems. This video isn't licensed in Uruguay or whatever. I mean, like, hundreds of variations of bullshit why it's not working. Right? That's going to kill us. Right? If we don't make it liquid, somebody else will, and we just stand by and do nothing. Right? We have to do away, and my view is that anybody who is in the way of making it liquid should leave. Right? Because that's ultimate, I mean, it's a very simple capitalist principle. Right? In the connected society, people go around the hurdles. They find a way to go around it. Read Richard Branson's latest book called Screw Business as Usual, where he's talking about exactly this. He says, it doesn't matter what we have thought of that we would like to do with our customers. It matters what they expect from us. And the reality is the reality. We may want it to be different, but it's not. It's a liquid world. So then, of course, you know, in the music business, we've had these issues for a long time that we said, well, we, we wish it, maybe we can put some hurdles and put some rocks into the river, right? But where has that led us? We're here in 2012, and we're doing exactly the same thing that Napster did in 1998, which is how to figure out how to put the jukebox in the sky and make money from it, right? In the meantime, we sued lots of people, and we had lots of mediums. You know, we need to change this motto into creating a liquid world going forward. Netflix, Spotify, it's about access. Right? Today's consumer of music and of media in general is concerned with access. They're not concerned with copies. Yeah, there are, there are people who are collecting copies. You know, I have, I have CDs, I have books, you know. But that's not our future. The future is not to sell copies. And this is a sad truth, you know, that in many ways we have to say our future is not going to be uh, in cars that burn oil, right? Gas, that, that is not going to be our future of driving. Uh, in many ways, we like to drive like this, but it's not working. Our future in the content business is not about selling copies. I mean, look at newspapers, right? Newspapers, as you know, are in decline pretty much around the world, except for Eastern Europe and various 
select territories. In America, 27% decline of advertising revenues in newspapers. Many newspapers shutting down. So it's, this is a real big issue, right? So now my, my suggestion is really quite simple. You, you remove the word paper, keep the word news. Right? That's the solution. Because guess what? The costs of paper are 80% of the entire cost of the undertaking. Why do we need paper? People love news, they love curation, they love good writers, they love good opinions, they love quality, clearly, but they don't necessarily have to use paper to get it. So once we get used to this, we can say, well, this is kind of hard to do for the New York Times, you know, considering all the investment in paper. Right? Clearly, that's a problem. This is why most companies in the music business will have their butts kicked by internet companies, right? Because they're about the content, not about the distribution. It's not about distribution. It's about attention. It's about the content. It's about liquidity. It's not about shipping stuff. Right? So if we can do away with this, with this idea of saying that we sell copies, and, I mean, we're still selling copies, and that's, that's still a big income driver, of course, right? But here's the point. Yeah. If your argument is, I'm not going to allow people to have access to music for a lot less money because I'm still selling CDs and iTunes, right? then you're killing yourself. Right? Because what you're saying basically is saying you don't want to see what's actually happening until the very last moment where you can still make a dollar with the CD or the iTunes download. right? And then you're going to go flat over the cliff. It's like a guy who's like a horseshoe maker who's saying, I don't know what the train looks like. Right? Well, the train did away with the horseshoe makers. We didn't need horses when we have the train. Right? And that's our future. So we have to think in two levels. Right? If the world's music revenues are still 60% CD sales and iTunes, right, we don't want to get rid of this, really. Right? So we have to be like the Anoplabs, which is a fish that has four eyes. Yosemite Park, you can see them. right? They have two eyes looking up and two eyes looking down. Okay? The two eyes looking down are the ones with the old business, right? which we can't really completely get rid of and just stop. Right? But we need those two eyes looking up. Right? We need to find the new way of how we can monetize. Imagine, again, five billion people having access to digital networks on cheap devices. And these devices will not be iPads or Apple. They'll be $10 devices, solar-driven. $10 devices, I mean, then we can say, we can sell access to them as part of an offering. Right? Being part, it's very much like cable TV of a subscription. I think that is where we're going, that's our future. And uh, this is one of the most important paradigms of what's going to happen there. Uh, it's a lemonade stand, right? It's free lemonade. And the woman says, it's not free, or it's free. They sell you information. This is the nutshell of our future, right? What people do in media, on television, on Facebook, on Spotify, on those channels, what they do and who they pay attention to is going to pay our bill going forward, right? Because when people are in those systems, they create a huge amount of value for everyone. They create data. They look at ads. They opt into other things. They buy things, right? I don't know if you're aware of this, but the global advertising budget in media is $560 billion. Marketing, public relations, and other assorted lying is another $400 billion. You have a trillion dollars. I mean, a trillion dollars is spent on reaching us a year. A trillion dollars. If you don't think that Spotify or YouTube or any of the other guys is going to make enough money from advertising to pay for music, then you know, I, I can't help you because the, the, math, you know, the math is clear here. We just have to say, okay, when? Right. But if we say that they have to pay everything in advance until they get there, then we kill them also. Right? So basically, if you're seeing why does Google make $3.7 billion a month? Right? What do they do? They don't own anything. They own servers and stuff, right? They don't make content. They don't own a network. They don't put the cable in the ground. Right? Nothing. What do they do? They sell information. What are your thoughts on the ritual radio in the future for the radio? Yeah, good point. I think uh, radio has a good future if radio can adapt to the ways of distribution that we have in the web today 
and expand the licenses. I mean, one big problem is, of course, podcasting. You can't do this. And so radio has to enhance the license grant. right? And the good thing about radio is curation. Because right? as I was saying earlier, it doesn't matter. I mean, we used to be very excited about this 10 years ago. We would say, OK, we have access to 60 million songs, and they're all free. Now, that was a very exciting news for a lot of people. Right? But guess what? It doesn't matter. My time is a lot more important than a dollar. For most people in the Western world, they're more worried about time than money. So if you can, in the news business or in radio, create a mechanism where you're saying, you know, by having the time-saving factor and the curation and the value of the experience, that's what you pay for, right? You don't pay for the music or the content. You pay for the packaging. I mean, this is why we love apps. Okay, I checked yesterday, there is about 22 divorce apps, you know, that will teach you how to get divorced uh, on the mobile phone, right? You can do that all on the internet, or you can just do it, right? But the reason you buy these apps is because of the packaging, right? It looks better, it feels better, it seems easier, so you buy an app, and it's only a dollar, right? So, bottom line here is that radio has a, has a strong future if you're able to uh, expand into those new places and keep the role of a curator. Right? I mean, this is why I listen to KKSF or to KCRW or, the, or BBC Radio 1. Not because I can't get the music for free somewhere else. I can, right? but because they are really great at curating. This is why I read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and this is why I spend money on all the other stuff you know, that I spend stuff on because of curation. Right? Because I don't have the time to go out to 100,000 YouTube tracks. Uh, and I like Pandora, but it's not good enough for me for the programming. So this principle of paying with, uh, with data and with attention is a principle for the future. And the music industry has to come to the point of where they're saying, well, who are the wardens of this information? Well, clearly Google, Yahoo, and very soon Facebook, and Twitter, TNN, the Twitter News Network. Right? They have this information. They know what to do. And they can turn attention into money. So, I mean, it's absolutely amazing to see. I never felt so amazed me how, how this happened in China. When Google owns a company called Top 100, which is a search engine in China, right? Top 100 has made a deal with the record labels that you can stream and download the music for free from the search engine. Okay? The reason being is that Baidu, which is the biggest search engine, allows you to put in Santana MP3 and then you can just download it, right? Google does not allow that. So what they did is they said, OK, we want to do the same thing. So what we're going to do, we're going to give all of the rights holders a piece of the ad revenue on top100.cn in return for free streaming and downloading, just like Baidu, but cut you in. Right? And guess what the record label said, the big record labels? They said, this is great because China is screwed anyway. Right? We don't get money from China, so we'll take you whatever, 20 million. We're happy to get it. Right? And here in Europe, where we're still buying, we don't get this, right? Because the money would be two billion, right? It wouldn't be just 20 million, right? But the logic is quite clear, right? If we are able to get in and make it legal what people want to do and participate in the revenues, we'll make a boatload more money than we do now by saying that they have to apply to our theories. And of course, you know, ultimately, I mean, this graph from uh, Kleiner Perkins shows the logic, right? 1999, the global internet user, average revenue per user was $9 in 99. Now, in 2011, the average value of an internet user is $49. Now, why in the world wouldn't we take this money? Why wouldn't we go and say, we'll participate in the flow of these revenues and allow this to happen? The answer is, because we're thinking about our own pizza. We're not interested in building baking a larger pizza, we're interested in eating the pie of our neighbor. That can't continue. So um, I'm writing a new book. It's called From Ego to Eco. And it's very much motivated by the music business. Right? We have to get off the ego society. This will kill us. right? Because basically, if we don't agree that we're going to play ball with the other guys, they're going to play ball with somebody else, and we'll be left out there somewhere in the field. Okay? Uh, and this is only the first part of the story. The second part of the story is this will happen regardless. And when, when it happens, whoever is best at having attention will make the most money. Right? That's not really different than now, but very dramatic. Okay? 
On radio, for example, if you get lots of radio airplay, most countries around the world, you get a percentage of the pot. This is why we like, you know, I'm a composer. I get 50 euros a month or something for a couple of measly songs I've written. Okay? 50 euros or whatever it is. In the future, if we license the internet, right, if we make it legal to do all these things, every time somebody pushes a button, a tiny coin can fall into the virtual box somewhere. Just like radio. But as long as we say, you know, you have to come to us to ask for permission to play a song above 60 seconds in Switzerland, and we're going to discuss this for four years and send your facts back then, you know, that, that's not going to work, right? I mean, as I showed you earlier, the speed, right? The speed of the web is mind-boggling. Right? You know, car companies used to have a new car. Every four to six years, there'd be a new car. You know what the time invention cycle is for car companies now? 16 months, next model. Microsoft had 20 years to rule, to dominate. Okay. Google had five years. Facebook has three years, timing out this year in terms of dominance, picking. Right. Twitter has two years. The timing is increasing like crazy, and we're still sitting here arguing about whether we want to participate. Okay. We can't afford it. And this is a political issue, but it's also a practical issue. When that happens, Whoever is best at getting attention will get the most of the pot, just like radio airplay. If you have any questions, please uh, do okay. ask. So, so it's clear that the music business is, isn't going to change. They're not going to license, open licensing. It's not going to happen. If it would have happened, we would see plans. DDEX, is, they've been talking about forever. We can't even get standards, let alone open licensing. What's going to happen? Who's going to be the disruptor who's going to create um, a liquid solution and change the entire business for, while the rest of the business has their pants down. Yeah, that's it's very, what's going to happen. Good question, to Tom. Yeah, I, I think we're a. I think we're at the point where many people are realizing that this isn't working. Right? Whether it's Hadoop or Three Strike or Acta or SOPA or so, these are all just constructs that are way too late and not working. Right? People are realizing. For example, in France, a lot of people are saying, "Well, yeah, we've got this Hadoop law, but what in the hell is it going to do for us?" I mean, is it? Does it actually have a benefit of any sort that we can feel? So there is a lot of rebellion against this. The second one is that uh, much like, for example, in Brazil, where you had pharma companies make an AIDS medicine and the Brazilian people couldn't afford 100 euros a month, the Brazilian government said, we need a public license for this medicine, a generic medicine. You either give us a deal or we break the license right? because we need to live. We need to have those people take those medicine, right? So Brazil broke the patent of the pharma companies, and then the pharma companies went to court, international court, and they lost because the court said, you have to be willing to license at the conditions that the local people can afford. Right? And the pharma company said, OK, we'll do it for $2. And you know what? how much it costs to make this pill? Like 0, 0.00 whatever, right? But of course, it costs a billion to build, right? So I understand the logic, right? So, Basically, as I was saying earlier, in an ecosystem, we have to come to the conclusion that if we don't collaborate on making this work, we won't, neither one of us will have anything. And I think this is starting to dawn on people now. If I may, uh, if I may argue with you, uh, please. Uh, you forget that those powers you're talking about, Facebook, Google, whatever, they're not willing to, put to actually work with the smaller companies at all. So basically, you cannot work with them. They decide. And if you go to them, they say, OK, you have to go through this guy or that guy, but they won't talk to you. So, and they're yeah. not the ones who develop the artists. They're not the ones who care about the music. They don't care about anything. Very good point. I mean, I think, that, of course, we are in this discussion of who can make this change. We're 10 years into a conversation, right? And there's a lot of fear on both sides. Right? So the internet companies and the telecoms are saying, you know, we kind of like this music thing or, or the movie business, right? But these people are incredibly stupid and difficult to work with. Right? This is what I hear from them all the time. It's like, we would love to solve the music problem, but these people are impossible to deal with. And, and now you're saying that they don't want to talk. I mean, exactly. it's probably both true, right? But the bottom line is, until you realize that we won't have anything either way, then that's when you start moving, right? So I think what we will see happening with Facebook, Google, and YouTube, right, is that when we show that we have an opening for an actual conversation, right? 
The, not com for, the conversation is only with the big companies, like Universal Music. They will not talk to somebody smaller than one of the major companies. Well, they, I think that uh, Facebook, if, of course, is talking to Merlin and all the other. That, that is ongoing. Right? So I wouldn't be that pessimistic on that. But, uh, and the Indians have a lot of power now. Right? So I, I'm not so sure that is a problem. But bottom line is I think we need to show that we're willing to talk. I mean, OK, imagine the situation when you're having dinner with your kids. Okay, and you are, you're calling the shots of the conversation every time that something happens, you won't get very far. Okay? You have to signal that you're willing to have an actual conversation. <laughs> and I think that it's a mutual process, right? Clearly. And, and the other issue, if I may say, is that the revenues for p record companies from Spotify or one of the other streaming services is still a fraction of a fraction of what you get via iTunes. Yet it's destruction in, in reality because people can hear it for free. That's yeah. a fact of life. Well, let me address that issue. And, I mean, and if you look at it, it's really a, the yeah. destruction of the record business, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but the question is like a volcano, right? We're, we're going to stop him to, to we're going to ask him to stop exploding. You know, this is just what happens. Right? But it's nature in a way. But basically, what's happening is that when you take uh, analog content, you know, DVDs or movies or, or songs, right? You put them onto a digital network, the value of that content is in general one-tenth, the money value, right? Because what happens is that in the choices that we have, and because distribution is basically free somewhere else, right, the value get, gets dramatically reduced. Right? So what happens here is that in, in, instead of saying that we're going to sell music and make the money from selling the music, we sell everything around the music, for, for example, the experience, the tickets, the merchandise, and the HD versions, you know, whatever other stuff we have, right? You can see this happening pretty much in every industry, right? It used to be the core value of what we sell is one thing, and the music that was CDs and downloads, right? But now, the distribution is in the middle, but it's basically the added values are getting to be much bigger than the middle, right? And this is something what we have to learn is to say, okay, if we have Spotify and people are not paying or they're, or they're paying with ads, right? Then what else would they pay for? And the answer is, is there's what Kevin Kelly calls the new generatives, right? There's 50 things that they would be paying. For example, high definition, classical music, right? Live recording from venues, live streaming. People already pay $350 million a year for classical music remote access, right? It's, that's already happening, right? Would they pay to be a fan and get into a private virtual room with the artists and, and see the latest remix? They would pay, and they are paying for that already, right? So uh, I'll skip to this slide because it's a very good question. Um, clearly speaks to the mechanics and the, and the issue here. Okay, Kevin Kelly, uh, blog, he's the he's co-founder of Wired and is, he's a really influential guy. If you put in Kevin Kelly uh, on YouTube, you'll see lots of speeches that, that he's talking about these things, right? And Kevin says, um, he wrote a book, What Technology Wants, which is kind of a hairy book, but you should read it if you, if you can. Uh, Kevin says, when copies are free, we need to sell something that can't be copied. And the reality is, as much as we would hate this, right, copies are free. They're not legally free, but they're de facto free. Free in some way or the other, right? So when copies are free, we need to sell something that can't be copied. And you know what? This is good news for artists. Because what cannot be copied is, for example, relevance, right? Is actually authenticity. It's got a whole range of, of things there he's talking about. I explained one of them, immediacy, okay? When you go to a concert of an artist, there's a trend now to say, well, you can buy that very performance that you went to because you were there, right? And maybe it's also videos, so you can see what actually happened. It's like a, like a souvenir, right? And it's immediate because as you're there, you're buying it, right? Using a QR code or a radio chip or a poster or a coupon or the mobile phone, right? And if the price is low enough, everybody does it. Right? And of course, it sounds bad because it's a live recording. It's not the same in the studio. Right? It's not as good, right? But it's an immediacy effect. And if I'm a fan, I'll buy it. You know, I used to sell books on my speaking gigs. And I could never have enough books, even though most people, I don't think, actually read them. But when I was done speaking, they would always buy all of the books because of the immediacy effect, right? They love to have the book, and I couldn't carry enough books. Right? So, and of course, bands know this. When you play somewhere, you can sell CDs, right? I mean, people don't like CDs, but they buy a CD anyway because of this authentic effect, right? 
So this immediacy is a very, very big thing that goes along with the idea of authenticity. Is it really you? Is it the real recording? Is it an authorized book? Is it an authorized translation of the book? Right? People pay for this thing. And this is why we pay for apps. Right? We pay for apps because of all these things. The app, in a way, is a new CD, you could say, but it's temporary. You know, don't, don't get too excited about that. Okay? People get tired of that, too. But basically, Kevin Kelly says this, is, this should be our motto for our future, to say, well, copies are free. What else can we say that can't be copied? Right? And that has a lot to do, for example, we had lots of sessions yesterday about branding. Right? This is why every single major brand in the next five years will make a deal somehow with music. Right? Because music is a factor of emotion that sells the brand. This is why Converse doing, is doing this. This is why they have the Pepsi Refresh project. This is why you have Kickstarter, right? Brands getting involved there. Right? So that's all very good news uh, for us in terms of what happens there. The other one is, for example, findability. Right? Findability means there's so many bands, so many artists, so many labels, you know, where do you all go first? Well, the answer is I pay attention to what my friends are paying attention to. Right? And I will pay for the social filtering, for the curation, I will pay, and then Facebook will launch these tools, right? And I will pay with my attention. For example, you can clearly see when Facebook goes public, right? Facebook has a, almost a billion users. Okay, Facebook is, 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 a, is a highway now. Right? It's a highway that we can drive on. And now Facebook is becoming cable TV without the cable. Right? In other words, Facebook is the ubiquitous platform for us to move our stuff on. The other thing is that Facebook has so much data, scary amount of data. I downloaded the other day my data from Facebook was 2.8 gig, and to, just to see what they have from me, right? They have all this data about me that Facebook can very easily go to brands and say, you know what, you want a 14-year-old kid that's into skateboarding whose father is on a cruise ship, we'll find that person for you. And they can make a match and they can do the right pitch and pay for our content that way. Right? So they, you'll see a very, very powerful relationship, for example, this idea of selling things on Facebook. Right? That is clearly going to be a major platform for us, uh, as much as Facebook has other issues, of course, that we don't really want to touch on. Uh, quickly about this point, and I think you know, we're a little bit out of time very soon here. Um, don't let people like Rupert Murdoch or Fox or any of the other guys, right, or any of the guys in the record business confuse this, people are willing to pay. If I wasn't believing that, I wouldn't be standing because it would be ridiculous, right? I mean, why would you bother? People are paying everywhere. People are paying for the most bizarre stuff because they have a reason to pay. The problem isn't the pay, it's the wall. In newspapers, you have a reader who reads the New York Times, for example, that I like to read online, right? Sooner or later, you hit the wall and it says, make it or you can take it or leave it. It's like a hard stop. And most of people there, 2% of people saying, well, no, this is, well, I guess I have to do this now, right? And this is like iTunes. This is the iTunes wall, right? 2% of the population in the countries where iTunes exist continuously buy music. I mean, you have to be a fool, of course, to fill up your iPod for $10,000, right? I mean, who does that? I think there are some people who do that, right? But you hit this wall, right? Most people don't get over the wall. If you're going to base your business on this kind of model, you're in deep trouble. Right? I mean, never mind the other ones who are pissed off and just delete you forever. Right? So instead of doing it that way, right, we do it like this. We make a, gra a gradual climb to a place where they're willing to pay. Right? I mean, hey, that's not rocket science. That, that has been in business for a long time. Cable TV. Right? Cable TV works like this because what it costs to put the cable into the ground to get me cable TV is a lot more than the payment I make to start with cable TV. In fact, I think it costs them something like $800 to connect people to cable TV. If they came to me and said, you know what, you want cable TV, give me 800 bucks and then 100 a month. Right? I would tell them to get lost. Instead, what they did is they said, it's $12. And they ate their losses. Right. Now, guess what happens now in America? I don't know the numbers in Germany. It's more satellite. 
Now, $85 average is what Americans pay to cable television, and 80% of Americans are paying. Okay. Why don't we do it like this? I mean, why don't we find this approach of saying, you know what? We have these services. The first level is more or less free. The second level, you have an option to buy something else. And we go all the way up to where we want to be, which is 100% of the population. Okay. That's the only logic that works on the web. Twitter, Skype, Facebook, LinkedIn, Zing, eBay, Amazon. Okay. And you only will do this if you understand digital economics, right? Because otherwise you're saying, you know what? You pay or you get lost. And that's what we've been doing for 10 years. That's iTunes. I mean, as much as I love iTunes and Apple, I mean, obviously I love Apple stuff, right? That's not a solution. That's a fig leaf. Again, as much as I love the iTunes guys and Steve Jobs and his work, right, this does not solve the problem. So for us also as content creators, this model is much better because in this model, we are the key constituents. Right? Nothing goes without the real guys doing the real thing on the other end. And this is precisely why we don't have it, right? Because it puts the content creators and the consumers in charge, not the companies in the middle. So that needs to change. Um, another key important point, right? This is a, uh, a, a really interesting phenomenon in London called secret cinema. Okay, where you sign up for this club and they put on movie performances in bridges and subway tunnels and old buildings and so on. And you get to decide what place. Right? You're part of this experience thing. And this is by far the most popular way now that people discover really interesting stuff. And they go through their social network to connect there. Right? And this phenomenon clearly shows that you know, it's really about creating experiences. I mean, if you want to sell what you're doing, you know, if you're looking at the old examples in the music business, ECM records, put them all your world music or so, it's an experience, right? It's something special. That's what Motown Records and Blue Note used to be. Right? It's a stamp of something. It's like Burning Man, as I said yesterday, right? Why the hell did we go to Burning Man, or some of us, right? Well, it's a special experience, right? I mean, it can't be copied. Right? It, it can't just be copied. You don't sell a download of Burning Man. Right? Any more questions? I think we, we have to come to conclusion here very soon. Do we have time pressure, anybody? Do we have time pressure to actually get out of here? We don't. Okay, well, okay, I'll, two minutes, okay? All right, uh, I want to summarize a little bit, okay, before, you, before I let you go. Attention is the new currency. Don't worry too much about when you get started about how you're going to get money out of people. Right? The bottom line is when you have people's attention, right, the system is in place. Of course, currently we don't really have the system in place. That's another story, an infrastructure issue. But when you have people's attention, look at Facebook, right? They have people's attention, they're going to fetch $100 billion in the stock market. And then, of course, you have to merit to keep people's attention. That's another story, right? So attention is a new currency, very important. Um, we'll skip this one. As an artist or a label or a writer or a musician, you have to send a signal that you are a must-have. If you are an option, you're in trouble. Right? I mean, you have to have a, a signal that says, you know what, I am the one who's going to do this gig because I have the best Motown band in town. I'm going to do the gig. Right? Or you have to send a signal, a must-have signal. Right? I mean, this is why we have Lady Gaga being such a huge success. Right? First of all, of course, she has a whole different philosophy about her stuff, and then she sends a must-have signal. You must have seen it. It's like, a, it's like a movement, in a way, you could say. And then, are you worth talking about? Ask yourself that question. This is a very painful question. When I was a musician, I did this for 10 years, I decided one day, you know what? It's been interesting, but I don't really have that much to offer that I can be the must-go-to guy. Okay? So you have to be sure that you're worth talking about. Whatever the angle is, it has to be real. So uh, do we have more questions? Otherwise, I'm going to get to the end of this. As much as I rate on Apple on there, 
business philosophy. Here's our friend Steve. Rest in peace. And he said something very important. He says, stay hungry, stay foolish. And this is one of our biggest problems in the music business, right? For a long time, we were spoiled by the fact that we were selling CDs and made billions of dollars for nothing, essentially, reissuing stuff, right? And then we stopped being foolish. Right? We basically said, you know, technology is, you know, prove to me first where the money is. Right? If you're living your life based on ROI, based on return on investment, right? you're going to be so slow that you will wonder what has run over you when you're done at the end of the day. So you can't always think about return on investment when you make an investment in the future. Clearly, it doesn't exist yet. Okay. So stay foolish means, you know what? If good ideas are coming along, let's jump on them. Right. Let's agree that we will try this. And this is very important, I think, also for your personal career, is to stay open to what develops. I think what we're seeing this right now is that musicians are now part of society, for example, in advertising, right? Musicians are very, very sought after in advertising because of the ideas, because they can improvise. Right? So we have to remain open to all of the options. So that would be my tip for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Do we have an urgent question or a comment or a, 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 a bomb? Yes. Um, can we have a microphone then we'll, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap up in a second? Or just speak loud so everybody hears it. Okay. Which is this uh, slide about mechanics? Uh, a simple one, but you, you already saw it. Okay. Sorry. Because the question was about having big wheels, talking to big wheels. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. This one. Actually, that's a good one. Thanks very much for bringing this up. Yeah. Okay. Let, sorry, let me shortcut because I think people have to leave. Okay. I know where you're going with this. It's actually a very good summary. It's good that you lead us back to this, right? Because in a network society, we are part of an ecosystem. Right? So we have to create lubrication between the wheels, right? We have to collaborate to make this work. And what we're seeing here is that we're heading into a direction where if we refuse, we drop out. Right? So that's my final comment. Thanks very much for coming.